I am here. We're having a roundtable discussion with a few of my beautiful friends, and we're talking about the subject of raising children with our own intuition and raising intuitive kids, right? So I've had a, quite a few discussions around this topic with my um, friends, so I wanted to bring some of them in here. And I'll just let them introduce themselves. Um, my name's Esther Loopstra, and I'm an artist and educator, and I talk about things like intuition and flow. Hannah, do you want to go first and introduce yourself? Sure. Yeah. Hi, I'm Hannah Talbot. Um, I am a Reiki master, a yoga teacher, meditation teacher, and um, I my business is the Anamkara Healing Center. And so I do lots of workshops, trainings, classes, um, and and one-on-one -on -one, um, healing sessions. Um, and so, yeah, I, I think Esther, that's how you and I met was actually during um, a workshop. And of course, I love all of the offerings that you have. And that's where we, we last left off, I think, was right before this whole pandemic yeah. was talking about having you do some workshops at the center um, when it opens in Issaquah. Yeah. <laughs> Everything's on hold, but yeah. It'll so happen. <laughs> it'll happen, that's right. But yeah, so thanks so much for, for having me. Yeah. Leslie, do you wanna share? Sure. Um, my name is Leslie Blumenstein and um, I am, right now I, I am a professional patient. <laughs> I'm kind of recovering. <laughs> from a, some major medical stuff. Um, I've worked as a writer and in a few other capacities and I'm, that's actually how I met Esther. We worked for the same company. Um, she was the creative director and I was a content writer and copywriter. Um, and and, oh, oh, go ahead. Um, you two can say like how many kids you have and how old and- Okay, yeah, I whatever. forgot about that part. <laughs> yeah. Um, I have one son and he just turned 13 and we're just kind of adapting <laughs> to life <laughs> as, a, as an official teenager and life as a teenager in quarantine so yeah it just this subject matter has been particularly interesting to me so um thank you to esther for including me in this and hannah you have one child too right yep one one son um and he is eight um and same just trying to um yeah ride this thing out as best we can christy do you want to introduce yourself sure i am christy epler and i'm a marriage family therapist and i teach at seattle university in the couples and family therapy program and i have zero children but i love kids um but also i acknowledge take everything i say with a grain of salt, I come from a clinical and a research background, um, but I also know that there are many stories um, that don't work for all families. So um, I definitely hold the wisdom of the people who do have their own children. I have two dogs and I've pra practiced a lot of my behavior training with them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's the old, I mean, that's, I sometimes refer to my cat in, in scenarios, which is not at all the same as having kids. <laughs> yeah, but it's all, you know, I think it's all, um, it's, I completely relate because I even had the feeling of like, wait, I only have one son. Yeah. You know, I, I don't know what it's like to be a mom of three. So, so what is, what's my input? And it's like, well, they're, they're all valid and we're all, we really are all leaning on each other um, and, and to do the best that we can. Yeah, totally. Yeah. And it's like, I love talking about intuition. I've been teaching about it for so long, but I, you know, I don't have the experience that you have with having a family and kids and stuff. So um, that's why I wanted to have you all here and have this discussion and maybe it'll lead to like further, further discussions. Um, I know Hannah, we were talking about doing one in person. So yeah. Yeah, so I'll start off with the first um, question, which I think is really a good one that can lead us off is, um, how do I undo all the cultural conditioning that I have received and that I often default to as a parent? Mm -hmm. And um, so 
feel free, whoever wants to kind of chime in. Um, we all have different perspectives. So this is not about like who's right or wrong, but like just what we, our perspective. So, yeah. Um, I think I think I would ask that question or mm -hmm. something similar to that. So I, that's just something I struggle with because I look at um, my own stuff, <laughs> I guess I could say, shaped by my upbringing and my, you know, what I was surrounded by and, <clears throat> recognize some things that I'm I don't like <laughs> about that and want to change and want to create different space but I find that especially in the most stressful moments that I you know not consciously I just sort of default to my experiences you know that I had or what shaped my experiences so it's I struggle with that because then I kind of reflect back and go Ugh, I know I would have liked to have handled that differently, mm -hmm. but in the moment, that's kind of all I had to draw from. <laughs> so it could be kind of frustrating. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Christy, do you have any input from uh, <laughs> your perspective? Well, one, I can totally understand the frustration that in those moments where you feel heightened, you just react and you survive. Mm -hmm. And, and knowing that is okay and you're doing the best you can in the moment, um, I think is, is important for us to acknowledge. Um, I am inspired by this book called Feeding Your Inner Demons. Um, and part of that is to say, to get to know kind of what this author calls demons inside you. And, um, and I think I hear you saying that you've already examined, you've looked at your automatic responses and I think that's huge as well. Um, and, and to do that, uh, maybe through a little bit of a different lens of, of really getting to know these automatic responses and thanking them for a time you know, that they have worked because our natural tendency is to push those things away mm -hmm. and seeing if you have learned anything from it, if you would wanna adapt it, shape it, but keep it in some way. And then if you don't, just saying, you know, thank you, and this doesn't serve me now. Um, but, and I, I know it's a little bit of a paradox, but um, when I hear people wanting to move forward, I think part of that process is slowing down and um, really kind of embracing, getting to know, acknowledging, journaling about um, what, what does come more as an automatic response, because that is what you're saying, a piece of creating this new space um, and as you do that, I think what you might notice and what I suspect you will notice is you're already doing things differently. Um, so even though you feel like it's the automatic response, um, the more you get to know these um, demons that are inside, you'll say, hey, I didn't do that exactly the same way. I did something a little different or I mm. shaped it this way. Mm. And, and so you don't have to expect, you know, like, oh, I'm going to do it differently. You just start to notice really the subtleties of oh my gosh, you know, I, you know, maybe screamed when I wanted to validate or empathize. But, you know, that moment before I screamed, I took a longer breath and that was helpful. Mm -hmm. The next time I'll take two longer breaths. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Thank you. And it's that author too, just if you're interested. It's um, Alaone, A-L-L-I-O-N-E. And it's feeding your demons ancient wisdom for resolving inner conflict. Thank you. I love that. Thank you so much. Did you want to add anything, Hannah? Yeah, I mean, I, I just was nodding my head through most of that, I think, um, because that <clears throat> right now, especially we're getting so much time to slow down and really analyze our our parenting and how we're doing things and having to really um, watch our own behaviors because there is no breaks and there is nowhere to go. And, <laughs> and, and so for me, you know, as I was thinking about how, you know, what questions I, I have for myself and, you know, what, what things I think about when I, when I ponder intuitive parenting and it all comes back to mindfulness and um, you know, trying to be more present and aware in the moment so that you can take that breath before the reaction. Mm -hmm. And 
one breath before a reaction is huge. <laughs> Two is amazing. Um, and, and I'm right there in the thick of that practice, um, trying to just slow my reactions down enough for me to actually be in the driver's seat of them, you know, um, and, and not do the, the, the conditionary reaction. Um, from my own parenting and my parents' parent, um, I've noticed that coming up a lot. Like, oh, that behavior right there, that little tinge of anger, that's not only not, not just my own, that comes from my mother and then her mother. And I didn't get to know my great grandmother that well, but I'm guessing from her mother as well, you know, and so, yeah, it's, um, there's, there's so much to unpack and I don't think it gets unpacked in a week or a month or a year. It's a continuous <laughs> unpacking mm -hmm. and it's a continuous practice and then relating to it in a different lens as we evolve age our children evolve and age we're constantly looking at a new lens when you know what what worked for me as a parent what worked for my child when he was two right doesn't, doesn't work now right <laughs> like you can't just go oh I got it <laughs> right and then you're in cruise control um for the next 18 years um so yeah I I just I so relate to all of it and for me it just it's you know, and I'm a yoga teacher, I teach breath, and I still have to constantly check myself, um, and my own behaviors and wonder where the heck they're coming from. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, I think that's, thank you all so much. I think that's, you know, where con getting connected to our intuition is so important, you know, because it can really help us to, like, tap in and like you were saying like we're always pivoting right mm -hmm. we're always like our seasons are always changing and what what kids need when they're babies is not the same as 13 year old mm -hmm. kids need so yeah. um like if you have that relationship with your intuition there is you can ask it like okay what is what do I need now what does my family need right now yeah because like when we're connected to our intuition, we not only know what is best for us, but for other people, it, it seems to be um, not just about us, but it seems to be about the whole. It seems to incorporate more than just us. Um, and I wanted to say, like, I've been thinking a lot about um, what we've inherited as a culture and this top-down sort of mentality where mm -hmm. um, we really have, it really is like the slave, slave mentality, um, industrialization, you know, this top-down mentality. And we can't help it, we've just inherited it. Mm -hmm. So I think that we, you know, it's in our education system, you know, you do what the teacher tells you, you don't think about what's what you want to do, right? You do you do what the example shows you. It doesn't matter how how you interpret it, right? So, and then in your job, like you do what the boss tells you to do. And of course, like our parents parented us that way. So, mm -hmm. you know, like we, that's an automatic way that we're going to parent. But it's like, we have the ability mm -hmm. to change that right now for the next generation. And I really think that there's a shift going on everywhere, like to shift from this top down, I tell you what to do to a sense of having a sense of autonomy and trusting yourself and bringing your authenticity to the whole, you know? Mm -hmm. So it's like, I'm really passionate about like, can we teach kids this? you know, to trust themselves and to like, how do we do that? You know? So I think that cultural thing that's passed down is really, it's really a great question. Um, so thank you all. And then the second one, um, 
Let's see. Esther, could I just add yeah. one thing on to what yeah. you're saying? Because I really agree with that. Like the ties are shifting and yet we still have so much that was passed down to us. Um, and I think as women, potentially, we don't always give ourselves a break. Um, and so one of the rules or the guidelines that kind of motivates me is to think of the research that says, as long as we're shooting for about five positive interactions to one negative interaction, we're still in um, the scope of having really bonded, healthy relationships. Um, so giving yourself a break if, um, you know, one out of five interactions, you maybe lose your temper and um, as long as everything is safe, um, that, you know, you're not acting your best self. Um, so, you know, as long as you're practicing nonviolent communication, good listening, empathy on a day-to-day -day basis, there will be times where, you know, you get really frustrated um, and just having some grace for that, that um, a lot of times I think caregivers get pretty worried because I thought, oh my gosh, I really flew out the handle and what effect will this have on our relationship or my child? Um, and just to see the overall arc of, you know, if if many days or many interactions in the day, you know, you're, you're kind of being positive and, and you're really bringing your best self, there will be those times. Um, so just kind of monitor yourself and, and just give yourself credit saying, gosh, I had five times where I complimented my child or I saw their best selves or I let them have a break. And if the next time, that sixth time, you kind of fly off the handle, you know, that's okay. We all make mistakes. I love that. Yeah, because I think we see our negative side more than actually what reality is, right? Which leads yeah. me to the next question about mom guilt. So how do I use my intuition to guide me against mom guilt <laughs> or trying to keep up with what I perceive via social media and cultural conditioning as the standard for motherhood, which I feel like I've talked to every mom about this. Like this is, I feel like this is the number one thing for parents, at least for moms. Um, so yeah, would, either of you two moms like to <laughs> chime in first on this yeah that um it's such uh, for me that i would say is the theme of my entire motherhood <laughs> <laughs> and and when i look at it through the lens of you know how do i use my intuition and I look back to when I first became a mother versus now and recognizing that for that first couple of years, though, yes, intuition was certainly guiding me. Um, there wasn't a, an awareness that it was right. Like I knew to do what I trusted in my gut and my heart for, to be best for my son, but in terms of like how to, um, soothe myself as a mother and how to sort of like know what like what to what to trip out on and what not to um, not having intuition and not having that enough stillness and slowness to kind of hear that inner voice and ask those questions to myself was was definitely tricky um, and I think that this is right now I think more than ever like as soon as this quarantine thing went down boom right away all of these pictures started flying up of like all of the homeschool efforts that everyone was putting in and i you know mm -hmm. we've done this project and this project and homeschool not you know and yeah. it, it just immediately was like i felt pressure and then my intuition kicked in and was like what's best for us right now and do i trust that we've done enough work educating my son and that he is healthy and stable enough that he can sustain a couple of days or weeks without his exact same schedule, right? Like, he, and, and he's able to function like that and, and that's mm -hmm. okay for him, you know? And it was like, that was intuition. That wasn't a book, that wasn't a, you know, that wasn't, um, it was just my own self knowing what was best for my family 
um, at the beginning of the quarantine was to actually just kind of go really slow and create lots of cozy time and lots of kind of one-on-one -on -one play and um, not get too stressed about the educational component of it and let that sort of, um, you know, come to a more um, balanced place. But yeah, um, you know, that's one example. And that certainly doesn't mean that in this two months, <laughs> I haven't questioned or wondered if I was doing the right thing at the right time in terms of his, you know, education and um, well-being within quarantine. But yeah. Mm -hmm. And what about now? Like, do you feel like you still maintain that connection to your intuition with what's um, like the education or the d dynamic? Yeah, yeah, I do. And I mean, today's a perfect example, right? Like it's, it's Friday. We've, we've been, um, you know, doing his schoolwork consistently every day for the last, you know, five days. I have a busy day. He's starting to get itchy, right? So it's like, I'm not going to push and make yeah. him do that extra 10 minutes because of, 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 of math homework, right? Like, because it's, it's, it actually in the long run doesn't do either one of us any good. And so not letting the guilt of, but what do other moms do? And what do other, you know, how are other families parenting their children? And is his teacher going to see that we didn't do that extra 10 minutes, you know, like, who is that for? You know, yeah. like, yes. I can see that he has the concepts and he's, you know, he's, he's, he's doing writing and math and all sorts of different ways, not just within the computer program, you know, that we log minutes onto. So just being able to kind of check in with that. Um, yeah. It, it mm -hmm. does help. That was so beautiful. And I think what people need to hear right now so much. And I wanted to ask you, number one, how do you hear your intuition? Like, how does it speak to you? And then two, how do you kind of block out that guilt or not block it out, but like sure. see past it? Yeah. Well, for me, I think it's all, I mean, it's shifting the internal conversation that you're already having with yourself. We're all, all having an internal conversation with ourselves constantly, right? And so it's kind of shifting and sort of just getting clear on what that dialogue is and where it's coming from, to me, helps me separate out whether the voice I'm hearing is coming from a place of my ego or if it's coming from a place of my higher self and my, 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 you know, knowing, right. Like this is what's best for me, or this is what's best for my family. And I think that that sounds really obnoxious kind of <laughs> when you don't have, when you, you know, I think back to myself five years ago when I was really just starting to develop that um, it's like, yeah, but how, and it honestly just is a practice. And I think journaling is helpful to sort of write out, you know, your thoughts when you're trying to separate out and um, sort of um, kind of look at mom, you know, that mom guilt, I, I'll put the quotations around that, that mom guilt. It's, it, it really is sort of naming the feeling, you know, what is it that I'm feeling? What is it that's, what is it that's happening right here? And then is that a truth? you know, is this a tr truth for me? And then just dissecting it from there, right? And usually within like two to three questions into that, it's like, this is bogus. This isn't, coming, you know, yeah. so you usually unpack it pretty quick, right? Like once you name it, I'm feeling this and it comes from this. And that starts to go back to that. And then you start, you know, going down the rabbit hole of... <laughs> the conditioning and why I reacted that way or why I perceived that that way or which is just again that's just that's that's the self-work that we're all doing you know to be yeah Leslie do you have do you want to say anything about this whole mom guilt <laughs> thing <laughs> yeah um I mean I think mom guilt starts immediately and it's totally is exacerbated by social media because we fall into the comparison trap. And even, even when people are posting their, their worst moments or labeling them their worst moments, it still is very curated 
and you know it's and I feel like it's a whole it's another layer <laughs> that we're having to, to learn how to manage um, that maybe our moms didn't um, but I definitely feel it now I mean I think Hannah when you're talking about the homeschooling as an example it's definitely that's definitely a standout you know I have kind of a spectrum of in my circle of what people are doing some people are super hands-on and like really like going the extra mile and setting up all these extra things and you know creating lessons and doing all this stuff and um you know and then there are other people that can't facilitate that because they're working and or you know just whatever they have so many other things going on and so it's hard not to feel guilty that you're not doing enough and you know as, as it's been especially strange having a middle schooler because some of it, I like, you know, the math, I would, it would be probably harder for me to try and help mm -hmm. at this point, go looking back and trying to figure out, you know, algebra. It's been a long time since I've, since I've used any of that. And the, and the methodology is, is a little bit different for how they explain everything. So it's, it's hard for me to help there. I mean, there are some subjects that I can help in obviously, but it, um, not a lot. And I also feel pretty lucky that I have a kid that is relatively, um, you know, he just kind of does his own thing. He doesn't need, he seem to need a lot of extra help and he can still kind of thrive. But, um, I've, I've kind of done what you're saying about like, when I start freaking out, like, oh, I'm not doing enough and, oh, he's going to get behind and doing all this stuff, having this narrative go on. Um, if I stop and ask myself, you know, what am I feeling right now? Kind of name it and then sort of challenge the belief around it most of the time it's just, it's not real. You know, it's not, it's not really true. There's not really a deficit happening. There's not, he's fine, you know, but it's, um, it's challenging because you, you feel this weird, you almost feel compelled, <laughs> I think, to try and do more. And you're supposed to be doing more and more. And, and, you know, you just keep should, 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 I should, should, should. And um, it's hard to sometimes make peace with that. So learning how to really listen to your intuition is it's been an ex interesting exercise because sometimes I find it to be easier than other times so it's it's definitely something that is a skill that you have to practice that just like anything else so but it's it's definitely helpful how about you Christy I was just nodding the whole way. I'm sounding a little bit shadowy. I finally got the video somehow it popped up and now I see everybody. Um, okay. So I was just really resonating with what you would say. And I think the only thing I would add on is um, just to really acknowledge and explore the feelings and the underlying feelings, especially when you're in communication with people who might trigger some of those um, guilt or feelings of insufficiency. Um, just, you know, to say, I hear you giving me a lot of advice. You know, I really appreciate you wanting to take care of me. And at the same time, I realize when you're talking, I just feel this feeling of I'm not good enough or the way I'm doing it. You know, really to put words to that. Because I think sometimes we just stay at um, more of a content level and, and we don't express um, what the situation, what the meaning is for us. Like the meaning is we, we're all striving to do our best and, and to love the people around us. And, um, and when people, even out of the best of intentions, critique that, um, there's a lot of emotions and feelings around that. So honoring those. Um, and then I have a feeling I'm already preaching to the choir on this one, but getting out of those situations, if they do trigger um, those feelings for you. Um, I just cannot even imagine being a parent in the age of social media um, and giving yourself time and permission just to stay away. I just, I notice from an outsider perspective that anytime any one of my friends post a, a question on social media, you know, they get so many advice and opposite, you know, like sleep training your child, not sleep training your child. And mm -hmm. people will say like, this is best practice. And, and to be honest, we don't know, like, we don't, we don't know what's best and what's best for your family. And, and just keep voicing that of um, everybody's entitled to their opinion, but uh, at the same time, you can take a stance of not knowing and be completely right. Yeah, thank you. If if I have another um, kind of 
thought about this, um, you know, and I really, I really do. So has, how many of you have read Glennon Doyle's Untamed? Have any of you? Yeah. Okay. So, yeah, I mean, I feel like she is putting voice to a lot of these because she has, I think, three kids. And she told a story about like when she was thinking about divorcing her cheating husband, how she went on line and asked for or Googled. She actually Googled (laughs) because she didn't trust herself, you know, and her whole book is about trusting yourself and what you know what is right for your family and what is right for you. And um, so she went online and there was like, like you said, Christy, all kinds of different Mm -hmm. advice. And she looked at herself and was like, I am this lady who is like asking for advice from Google and not trusting myself. And I think another, you know, another thing to do is to look at people like her, like, you know, going back to the cultural pass down stuff, we don't have that many role models for us to look to moms and people, women who are trusting themselves and doing what they know is right. You know, so like, I think Lennon Doyle is one of those people who, um, there's a word for it kind kind of like called expanders, like, somebody who kind of expands your view and who you can look at and be like, Oh, she doesn't give a F like she's trusting herself. Right. So can I trust myself too? And I like to just kind of keep those people in my social media or in my world view, you know, whether they're friends or like people in the media, um, people that I can look to who are really doing their own thing, you know, trusting themselves, doing their own thing, parenting the way that they feel is right. So that's just another kind of, you know, um, thing that I think um, is helpful sometimes. Yeah. Um, let see. How do we feel? Do we feel like one or two more questions? how do we arm our kids to function in a world as in the world as it is as it currently is versus how we wish it was (laughs) so I'm going to do this question and then I'm going to do just one more question after this so Um, Yeah, so how do we arm our kids to function in the world as it currently is versus how we wish it was? I think this was yours, Leslie. Do you want to explain a little bit more? Because I've heard Um, you talk about it, but I think that's a really good question. Yeah, I guess I'm I'm thinking like kind of going back to what you were saying about a top-down approach, right? So that is kind of the world that we live in. And that is kind of the world that our kids at some point will have to function in, right? Whether it's a job or, you know most university t- I mean there's there's going to be varying degrees of it of course but they're going to have to learn how to function within a system where there's a hierarchy and where they're going to have to be given something to do and they're you know what I mean and it's l- sort of like how do you balance this idea of you know following protocol and following rules and there is a, a, a right way or a specific way that you you have to do it versus being more self-led and and I'm definitely not suggesting that they're mutually exclusive but I just sometimes I feel like when I'm trying to teach him to trust himself or it feels like I'm going against the grain sometimes in the way that I'm parenting and then I feel like am I doing a disservice in some ways like not 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 all or nothing but I mean like I don't know I I guess I'm not really articulating it very well but it, it feels um I don't know. It just feels interesting. Like I want to make sure that he's armed for the world that exists. Um, but also I'm trying to teach mindfulness and to be able to listen to his own voice. You know, like I always think of this quote, someone said this to me a long time ago that they, they don't want the voice in their child's head. They don't want it to be their voice. They want, they want it. 
they're they're being the parent. They don't want it to be their voice. They want it to be their kid's voice. Like when they're making oh. decisions, they want them to hear their own voice, not the okay. parent voice saying, don't do that or whatever. So it's sort of this balance of how do you, I don't know. Does that make sense? Yes. I love that question. Yeah. It's like, I think it's a fantastic question. Yeah. And I mean, and I think, I think it's, it's, an, it's another one of those where for me anyway, it's, you're constantly evaluating and balancing, mm -hmm. you know, because, because, and I, I, I think that that is sort of probably the basis of most of the arguments that my husband and I get into around parenting, right? Mm -hmm. Like is, yeah. you know, what are we teaching him? What are we setting him up for by doing that, by saying yes. that, by letting that thing happen, by not, you know, showing him that. Um, the perfect, the, this, this exact thing happened to me, um, two days ago, we, um, my husband needed to go into work for the first time in two months and pick up a monitor. And so we were like, well, let's, I, I would like to see what Seattle looks like. We live over in Issaquah. And so we just, we were like, let's just drive through, you know, downtown Seattle and see what the buildings look like. Um, and so we were driving through Pioneer Square and we all had our windows rolled down and there's not as many cars and there, it, there are a lot more um, people, unfortunately, um, on the streets, you know, and, and this is a huge, heavy subject, right? And, and, mm -hmm. and we can see it, we see it all the time here in the Seattle area. So the conversation I'm, I'm having, you know, with my eight-year-old, but within, you know, his what works for his eight-year-old you know framework so so anyway this this woman um comes up to our car approaches the car with a sign and is is really coming up though like coming into our windows mm. and my husband just his and then you know he started to roll up his window and then she went around and came to my son's window and he my son was like oh hi Hey, you know, he wanted to be how he normally is, which is friendly to everyone, no matter what you look like, who you are. Right. And, and he can see that, yes, she's homeless, but he's reacting with empathy and love. Right. And then also feeling like he's trying to explain to Ian, my husband, to not roll up the window because he's trying to say to her, like, like this is all happening within seconds. And my husband's like, no, not having it. Like I'm rolling up the window. Like this isn't yeah. safe and I don't feel comfortable. So um, it was this exact, like, okay, how do we teach empathy, safety? And, you know, I mean, so much, right. And, and, yeah. and do it in a way that is, is, yeah, is, is loving, but also does set him up for some realities of the world. But <laughs> So yeah, I, I don't necessarily have the exact answer, but more just to say that I think that is the struggle we're all in. And so mm -hmm. whenever we can kind of say like, man, I'm not alone on that <laughs> journey, that, that's, yeah. that is helpful in and of itself. Yeah. Yeah, definitely. Christy. Yeah, that's a great example. And yeah. And I also want to pick up something um, you mentioned earlier of staying in the present moment. Um, and I definitely get like thinking ahead and wanting the best for your kids. Um, what comes into my mind is my mom never prepared me to live in a pandemic and that's okay. We're all surviving. <laughs> <laughs> but, but one of the cultural messages I, I really think we have received and I want to break apart a little bit is that child and adolescence is training ground for being an adult. Yeah. And the more we can stay present and also a little bit of encouragement that we don't have to over explain and overthink things and that differences can really live in peace with one another. So in the car example, um, you know, I think it would be okay if the family agreed to this to, you know, let a kid have their natural empathy and friendliness and also for dad to roll up the window and just say, I wanted to feel safe and all of that is okay. Yep. Um, and and release a little bit of the pressure of we have to think of childhood and adolescence as like this trajectory um, because staying in the present 
thinking about um, augmenting your kids' strengths, setting up um, core values that you agree on as individuals and as families, and focusing on that. Like uh, my two are courage and compassion. So anything I can do that really roots me in courage and compassion is going to serve me now, and I think it's going to serve me as a 60-year-old if I make it that far. Mm-hmm. Uh, and and so just kind of embracing. I think the more we do kind of those what ifs is we, we get let down a lot of rabbit trails and um, and I can understand that completely. Um, but it's one of those kind of things I always want to acknowledge and let go as much as possible. Mm. Yeah. I think it was, you know, it's really interesting. I love that you said, Christy, that um, like adolescence is, you know, this time where um it is train it's training them to be able to make those decisions themselves and really like um i know so many people who their parents didn't allow them to do that because they wanted to shield them from the world and you know when kids are babies you know up to a certain age right we have to trust our intuition for them, right? We have to like, we have, they don't have the cognitive ability to be able to, you know, make certain decisions. So like your phrasing arm them, like how do I arm them? It's sort of this, like, a, like I want to protect them, right? I want to yeah. protect them from these, these um, cultural things or the world that we live in. So like, I mean, when they're, and Christy, you can tell me if I'm right on, but, you know, up to a certain age, of course, like we have to, the safety is primary, right? So we're trusting our intuition with like safety, but then when they get to a certain age, like we really want them to be um, making those decisions and maybe even seeing like, can we peel back the curtain and can we have a discussion like this is how society is it's been like this because slavery because corporate greed you know I mean I don't know what age we bring that discussion into but like this is how the world is but this is I want you to have autonomy. I want you to trust yourself, you know, and um, and teaching kids, you know, how to listen to their feelings, how to recognize their feelings. And um, this will maybe go into the next question. But yeah, I just think like, um, yeah, there's a time when like that kind of um, keeping them from keeping them from safe from everything is super important and then slowly letting them you know be making and I love that I love that example so much of the car and I love that you said yeah everybody can share their own feelings about it the situation you know like I think you know a lot of times we have that top-down mentality like we gotta make we gotta make a decision for the whole family but like why can't we have a discussion you know about how we're all feeling and Mm -hmm. and and really begin to respect that um, in each other and yeah. Well, I think if we're, you know, I mean, and if that's step one into leading with your intuition is just allowing feelings to be, you know, I mean, just, I think we're like, we're teaching, I, I do think that that is a shift in parenting versus from when we were all children. It's much more, um, you know, most, parents that I know it's very important to allow your child to feel what they're feeling right mm-hmm. and so that already we're we're doing them you know mm-hmm. we're, we're we're step one in, yeah. in in leading by example and getting them to listen to their voice because if you don't know how you feel you certainly can't distinguish the voice that you're hearing and let it become a guide and something that you're working with instead of, you know, against or not at all. Totally. And that's, Mm -hmm. that leads perfectly into my last question, which is how do we equip our children to listen to their intuition and how do we 
give them the tools for that and encourage that. Mm -hmm. Esther texted me this yesterday and um, just, and my automatic response to this was let kids be bored. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I just, you know, I think probably for a long time, but definitely in the last 20 years, like things have become so scheduled and structured and we carry our calendars around now with our, our phones. And um, I mean, just, I think intuition needs a breeding ground. And the more we have those quiet moments and we're bored, the more we kind of figure out what we, what we can and want to do. Mm -hmm. and, I, and I see that being lost in chat. Like I see the creativity, the imagination, um, us not making as much, us as a, a cultures here, um, making as much room for that. I mean, my parents used to take me over to my grandmother's farm and like I'd have the whole porch to myself for hours and that was it. <laughs> and I'd have to like <laughs> make up stories and, and entertain myself. And, you know, those are actually some of my favorite childhood memories of, you know, there's no TV. I usually carried a book in my pocket, but other than that, like it was me in a porch. <laughs> I love it. Yeah, I so agree with that. How about you, Leslie? You you are so good at this. I know you are. <laughs> I don't feel good at it. <laughs> um, but yeah, I um, I feel like from a very young age, I just would encourage him to be like, well, how does that make you feel? You know, that was one of the things I, I think I've asked him that for his entire life since he could speak. Mm -hmm. um, and even before that, like I was teaching in sign language and stuff before he was verbal. So like for me, I think that's a carryover from my own childhood is making sure that he had a voice mm -hmm. um, and was able to say that. So I feel like that that's that's probably, you know, that step one and 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 kind of like what Christy was saying about it's and I think where we're at now with being a teenager and he's really spreading his wings, right? And like testing boundaries and trying to figure out who he is separate from us and mm. all that stuff. And that is very testing as a parent sometimes. So this idea that not one person's feeling doesn't get to dominate everything. Like everyone can have a different feeling about the same situation is something that we're just as a family kind of working on and acknowledging. So I think that's a huge part of it too, is that that will help you trust your intuition because you're not comparing yourself against other people if you know that there's not just one right answer, I guess, or right one right way to feel mm -hmm. about something or handle something. Mm -hmm. So that's love kind, of that. kind of where we're at, <laughs> but it's, it's hard. It's really hard. And it's hard when you have two parents that come from different you know, each parent has a different way of, mm -hmm. of their default or what, or what they think is, is the important thing for the moment or lesson for the moment or feeling for, you know, it's just, it's hard to, to navigate all of that and make everybody feel heard and validated. Yeah. A, a constant um, work in progress. I was, um, I was reading a book and it talked about this method of listening so listening to yourself and to other people opening up. So mm -hmm. if you've taken my classes or listened to me, I always talk about like the narrow point of view, having like an open mindset, like a growth mindset, like mm -hmm. there's more than one answer, right? There's like, yeah. there's, 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 um, there's a solution. Like I believe that there's a solution, right? Um, and then reflecting, reflecting on everybody's you know, feelings and then releasing, releasing what you, that narrow thought that you might want to like hold on to. Yes. That's and, then, and then acting on it. So, yeah. How about you, Hannah? Yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I feel like I just echo what everybody said and um, yeah. And I think, I think for me really being okay with him having different choices than myself. Like you're saying, there's more mm -hmm. than one perspective. There's more than one way. And there is this feeling of course, of like wanting to mold them into the best version of what you want yourself to be. <laughs> yeah. you know, like 
what I want is for my son to um, love quiet walks in nature and he wants to meditate and do yoga and like just really, you know, be zened out with me. But that is not his nature. Like he's, mm -hmm. he's, you know, he's got a lot of energy and he moves and he wants to be loud and, um, and he wants, to, he doesn't, but it's funny because, you know, all of these things that are actually the, like the things that are my sticky points. Right. And so that, that push makes yeah. me to like, kind of like mold him even more like, no, no, you really do need the meditation, but um, mm -hmm. trying to just let him be who he, who he is allows him to develop his intuition. You know, if I'm not shoving, you know, if he wants to do yoga, great. If he doesn't, he's finding mindfulness in other ways. It doesn't have to be through that exact practice, you know? Um, so yeah, just, just letting them be their own, their own person. It's, it's a mm -hmm. lot easier said than, than done. I love to, I want to say two things about what you just said before I forget is that you um, both have talked about how you see, you see your child in a way that is um, unique, like it's different than how you want them to be, but you see the positive things that they are growing at, right? So they are growing into, and I think that is so important not to have this like narrow mindset of they need to be this way, but like to be able to open and like really see those things is like so amazing for a parent. Um, and the other thing I wanted to say, I don't know if I can remember right now. Um, let's move on to Christy and maybe I'll remember. I just wanted to pick up a bit on the difficulty when you and your partner might not be exactly on the same page. Um, and I think that that is such a common experience and also What's so important is the clarity around it. Because um, I was thinking even back to this great car example of, you know, even two things that are different can live in the same space as long as things are clear. So, you know, we want, you know, you son to be friendly, um, but dad did blow up the window. And so being able to talk about and clarify, like when one person makes an action and you know, maybe in that sense, you know, a parent does have the okay to to make a decision about safety. And continuing to revisit that because I um, remember, I think it was Leslie who said like, you know, it works and then, you know, my child became 13 and, you know, something else worked then too. Mm -hmm. So that's always the continued conversation because I think there's many factors that lead into intuition and creativity. And for me, the, the clarity, the transparency piece is so important that if you work on agreement, you'll probably not reach that. Um, but if things can be clear as much as possible for everybody that um, you've made some decisions of, you know, what are kind of our bottom line that people get to disagree, um, but then if it's okay, like, you know, for X, Y, Z, um, safety, for respect, whatever your family decides, you know, to say, you know, one person gets to call it because they don't feel it's safe. And then as a family, we've agreed to that. I think those things, when you kind of set a container um, and then give as much space as possible, that that container has to be really clear as well. Um, so I'm a big fan of, you know, five minute family talk times and other things, just not to talk about the issue at hand, but really to talk about all those dynamics that go into our intuition or go into family roles. Um, because I think that leads to more creativity and intuition. Thank you. Yeah, I feel like, um, you know, I, I just did an intuition workshop and I think one of the things with intuition that's really difficult is that we don't have language around it, right? We don't know how it works really. It's just like a gut feeling or following my heart or something like that. So I think like number one for us or for you as parents to 
um, begin to develop that language and connect to your intuition, like beginning to tease it out from like my fears, fears versus intuition. What does intuition sound like versus what does my mind sound like, right? Versus what do my fears and feelings sound like? Um, I think number one, like you and Glennon Doyle talks about this, like you following your intuition is going to show your children how to, right? So mm -hmm. you're the role model. If you're doing it, they're going to do it. They're going to pick up on it. And then giving them like talking like real plainly about it with them. Um, you know, like, I think you both said, you know, how are you feeling or how, you know, you might even just say like, what is your intuition feel saying about that? And can they get quiet and listen to their intuition versus like, you know, having the discussion, like, is that what you're feeling? Or is that a, a fear? Or is that like, you know, what your heart's telling you to do? Mm -hmm. um, and really investigating that with them, you know, and like, I love the idea of incorporating play more and um, Hannah, we had this whole discussion about your son like playing video games mm -hmm. and how you could really see that like he is being like so creative and mm -hmm. following his intuition in that, you know, and mm -hmm. um, and so giving him that space to really be able to, I, I've been doing a lot of like, um, inner work like inner child work and stuff when I go back to a certain age in my timeline all I wanted to hear from my parents was um follow your heart trust yourself can you trust yourself you know like when I looked back to them for guidance all of my heart was really wanting for them to tell me or ask me was I trust you do you trust yourself? Like, just follow what your heart is telling you, you know? So, yeah. That's yeah. So there's a difference between, you know, a reaction <laughs> out of like fear, anger, and your deep intuition and your deep knowing. And um, yeah. So I just, does anyone else have anything else they want to add to this discussion? I just feel like it's been so beautiful and helpful. Oh. Yeah, I loved what you just said. That, was, that yeah. was a lovely way to sum it up. Yeah. Yes, it was. I think that's I think that's what we want for our kids most of all, is for yeah. them to be able to trust themselves. Mm -hmm. Right. I think the only thing I would add to that is just some encouragement of I think the more we all trust ourselves and you trust yourselves as strong uh, mothers, as caregivers, as partners. Um, that's where it stems from as artists, as creators, as pet parents, whatever we are. <laughs> like, that's where it starts. And um, those around us, I think, will sense the more we trust ourselves. And I mean, all the affirmations, everything compassionate and strength based you would give to those in your circle. I just invite you this weekend and today to do that for yourselves. I love it. Thank you. Thank you all for being here so much. Thank and you. I think, Thank yeah, you. yeah, you added, you all added so much to this conversation. So maybe someday we can have it in person. <laughs> yeah. I miss yeah. people, I miss faces. <laughs> yeah. All right. Love you all. Thank you. Thank Bye. you.